And this question is about the, the jhanas. So can you please speak about the jhanas and how we can attain them? <clears throat> well, the jhanas, the four jhanas are the four uh, levels of absorbed concentration that are spoken about in the in the Buddhist texts, uh, you know, under right concentration. So the Buddha defined right, right concentration as entering and abiding in the first jhana, the second jhana, third jhana, and the fourth jhana. Uh, and <clears throat> but the hallmark of the jhanas is that, uh, you know, in initially you use an object uh, to focus on, because I, I mentioned that today when I was talking about uh, uh, having an object for concentration uh, in order to hold the mind steady because of all the, the hindrances. So the object is usually, you know, an object that's in the present moment. If you're focusing on your breathing, that's a present moment object. If you're focusing on a, a mental image, if you're happening to be visualizing like a, a mental image, because uh, that's also an object of concentration or, uh, but usually people take the breathing as the object of concentration uh, because it's something that's you know, immediately accessible. You don't have to create to do anything special by just focusing on the breathing. Uh, so then it's a concentration exercise. And it's also a preliminary for uh, developing uh, well, insight uh, also, but uh, <clears throat> anyway, the jhanas are di uh, increasingly different degrees of concentration. And, and as you gain concentration, the, the hindrances uh, stop. But Actually, the jhanas, a lot of people miss, un, you know, put the cart before the horse. And, uh, you know, the right concentration is the eighth, eighth step of the Eightfold Path. That means it's the last step of the Eightfold Path. Whereas uh, mindfulness, you know, comes before uh, attaining right, doing the right concentration. And there's a reason for that. So uh, a lot of people try to develop the jhanas before they've practiced right, con uh, right mindfulness and develop the four foundations of mindfulness. Uh, but, but anyway, because it's mindfulness that helps you attain the jhanas because it's the hindrances that prevent us from attaining the jhana. So if, if you're not mindful that you're sleepy and you just wind up spending most of the meditation period, it's not going to help you much. Or if you're told, always lost, if you're not mindful of your thoughts coming up, then you won't be able to let go of them and keep focused on uh, the breathing. Or any any of the hindrances. So mindfulness is actually a prerequisite for attaining uh, the jhanas, especially in terms of being able to recognize and apply the antidotes so that the hindrances can be let go of so you can spend more time focused on the, on the object. And then as you are able to focus more on the object, then uh, <clears throat> that then helps to weaken the hindrances also. But the jhanas have uh, 
So the five hindrances are sense desire, ill will, restlessness and worry, doubts, and sloth and torpor. And then there's what are called the jhana factors. Now, by being mindful and being able to let go and overcome uh, the hindrances, gradually you will gain the jhana factors. And those are applied and sustained thought. And this is also sometimes explained differently. If, the, if you're studying the Abhidhamma, they tell you it means one thing. And the, but if you read the sutras, uh, you know, it can mean another thing in terms of what is applied and sustained thought. But the word vitak and vichara does mean thinking. Uh, so it's the thought about the meditation object, usually. Uh, so just, you know, being aware of the thought of breathing in, breathing out, uh, that could be, uh, you know, applied thought. Uh, it means you're applying your attention to remember that uh, object of your concentration. So the, some word might be used uh, in the beginning such as earth element. If you, if you read the instructions on practicing the casinas, you know, you keep re reminding yourself of oh, earth, earth, water, water, water. Uh, and so that's an applied thought that you're uh, repeating that word to help keep the mind on it. So even like I give instructions about just reminding yourself, breathing in, sitting, breathing out, sitting, that's a kind of applied thought also. You're applying your mind to keep your attention, feeling uh, the breathing or the sitting or both. Uh, it doesn't have to be one tiny one object necessarily. Uh, but uh, so anyway, the applied and sustained thought. And then uh, we call the rapture and happiness. Uh, so that's a piti and sukha and one-pointedness. So these are called the jhana factors. Uh, and they become fully established when you attain the jhana fact, when you attain the first jhana. Now, you don't attain that immediately. It takes a lot of practice. And there's different stages of concentration, momentary concentration, and uh, or access concentration. which means, you know, little by little, you're gaining, uh, you're developing your applied and sustained thought. Uh, applied thought means, you know, you apply your attention to the object, but you lose it after a few seconds because of wandering mind. Then you apply it again, and then you apply it again, and you apply it again. And you keep applying it every time you get lost by the hindrance, you keep applying it. Uh, and bringing it back again and again and again to the breathing until finally you're able to follow that object longer without the hindrances interrupting. But that's why you have to have mindfulness. It's a mindfulness that's alert to when the hindrances are arising and cut off before they've taken you far away, you know, uh, or got you totally lost and distracted. That's why you just don't practice concentration, you practice mindfulness. And actually, concentration is simply unbroken mindfulness. So this idea of concentration actually is a, something different than mindfulness. It's not really. Uh, mindfulness is alertness. Now, whether you put that alertness on one object or you put the alertness on many different objects, it's still the alertness. So the concentration as we know it, that alertness is applied to one object, but it's still mindfulness. Only when it's unbroken, we call it concentration. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, so the first John is where you, uh, you know, when you're able to finally uh, keep the thoughts at bay and the hindrances at bay, then you get the, the sustained thought. And now you're no longer applying the thought 
the mind is staying on the thought. That's called sustained thought. And that means you don't longer, you don't have to concentrate anymore. I mentioned that I think in today's uh, talk. Uh, that you know we're applying the thought, we're trying to concentrate because our mind is still not you know is still uh, disturbed by the hindrances. Once the hindrances are suppressed, then the object. The mind stays on the object. That's what it's meant by the sustained thought. <clears throat> uh, and so it kind of stays there in front of your awareness without even trying. Uh, it's like when you look in a mirror, the object stays in the mirror. You don't have to try to keep it in the mirror, do you? You're just, you know, in front of the mirror, but it's just there. So the same way uh, with the sustained thought. And then because the hindrances are suppressed, you, you uh, gain the subtle, the, the vibrations from the unconscious mind, which is the PD. You feel the subtle vibrations, which is sometimes almost feels like your, your hair standing on like a hair on your arm standing up. It feels like a mild electric current going through uh, the body and nervous system. But people experience it in different ways. But it's called rapture. And that's because there's some element of excitement to it. Again, like this hair standing on end or the, uh, <clears throat> just these other feelings of uh, you know, mild electric current going through the body. And it, it can be at different levels. There's some, some levels of the rapture actually can cause you to levitate. Uh, but uh, anyway, it's largely, even though it's a mental, it feels like a physical thing. And there's a beautiful similes given in the, uh, Buddha's explanation of this uh, rapture, uh, it's like, it says you get a bath attendant. In the old days, they had bath attendants. And they had the bath powder. And they mixed bath powder with water and then they kneaded it until it was kind of like a spongy ball that's oozing with, uh, you know, this soapy water, and then they put that, or you can just imagine a bubble bath, okay? So let's say you're immersed in a bubble bath, a nice warm bubble bath up to your neck. And so the image is one drenches and suffuses the entire body with the rapture and happiness born of concentration. It's called born of, uh, no, born of seclusion. The first jhana is simply born of seclusion. Uh, and so that means like you're secluded in your, your bathtub, you know, away from the rest of your house, so, uh, away from all the noise and other things. And, but the image of, you know, drenching and suffusing every cell of your body with the rapture and happiness, born, or rapture born of seclusion. Uh, usually it, it mentions rapture and happiness together, but... Uh, so you get, it's a very kind of, uh, you know, vivid image, right? And so that's why it's more of a physical sensation. Uh, and it's a very pleasing sensation. So it's almost like an addiction. You kind of get, get addicted to it. And that's why people can get addicted to jhana and don't want to come out of it. And they don't want to bother with going on to develop vipassana because, you know, they just want to hang out in those blissful sensations. Uh, but there's not an end in itself. Anyway, so there's the, the rapture is the predominant kind of sensation that accompanies the first uh, jhana. But the happiness is there too. It's a little bit subtler. But the rapture is kind of more predominant because it's a more exciting type of thing. Uh, 
And then there's the one pointedness. That means the, the mind is not wandering. It's just kind of fixed there, absorbed in that, uh, that uh, feeling. So the rapture and so on takes, takes over from the object because now the object is not that important because it's already con- you're already concentrated. The object brought you to concentration. Now the objects of that are the, the jhana factors. <clears throat> and then you work on letting go of that rap- rapture because it's still kind of excitement. You have to let go of that, let that fade away until you're only left with with sukkha, with happiness. Uh, so in the second jhana, the applied and sustained thought also disappear. That means because uh, the you no longer have to apply or sustain any thought on the on the meditation object, and the object itself may even disappear because now the objects are the jhana factors and then you you try to let them go and so to enter the second jhana uh, or the third jhana the first jhana has the vitakami chara then you let that go because that's considered gross and then you're left with just the piti the sukha and the kagata on the second jhana. So second jhana still has the piti. Then you let go of the piti and then you only have the happiness. And if you read the definitions of the jhana, it says one who do, dwells uh, happily, one dwells in the third jhana uh, with equanimity. So it's a more mellow type of that, that excitement of the, the piti has gone off and now the simile for the second one is imagine yourself sitting in an artesian well or sitting in a pond with no incoming water or outgoing water. But there's an artesian well of nice cool water that's bubbling up from the bottom and it's just suffusing your entire body and mind with this cool soothing water. And that's the kind of the effect of the, of the of third jhana. And then even that disappears, or you have to let, even let go of that until you attain the fourth jhana, which is called equanimity. Purified, purified mindfulness with equanimity. So people think, oh, how can you be mindful? Mindfulness is there. It's been there all the time. Purified mindfulness. And and with equanimity. And that's a state of awareness. That's a state of present moment awareness. And that's why it's considered to be the foundation for vipassana. Again, your mind is not absorbed in some abstract hypnotic state or something else where you don't feel anything. You still have awareness. There's a lot of misunderstandings about the jhanas. But there's different ways that you can practice them. <clears throat> but if you read the text, it's very clear that uh, this is not an absorbed state where you become oblivious to it, anything else. But if the mind is concentrated and it's not reacting to anything else. It's not that you're shut off from that. Some people try to describe all the senses shut down in the jhanas. Well, I don't believe that. Uh, but anyway, that's a, another discussion. But uh, so the, the fourth jhana is a purified mindfulness and equanimity. That again is a, a totally, you know, equanimity means not reacting to any of the sensory stimulation. And then, every, then the Buddha says, from that fourth jhana, he doesn't say come out of the fourth jhana, like a lot of people talk about these jhanas, you got to come out of jhana and then practice mindfulness. Because if you read the, you know, if you read the standard uh, instructions of the Buddha, it says, 
from the fourth jhana itself, one then bends the mind toward the destruction of the defilements. Because in, in that fourth jhana, the mind is so clear and concentrated, the hindrances, that this is when you see the arising and vanishing in crystal clear clarity. You see the rapid fire arising and vanishing of mind moments in that fourth jhana. And that's why it's very easy to attain stream entry in enlightenment if one has reached that level of uh, jhana, uh, jhana level of concentration. Yeah, but I'd rather not call it concentration because again, people get confused with this idea of concentration. They think it's like a cat, you know, waiting to pounce on a mouse. So it's a little bit, uh, sometimes these, uh, you know, poly words and so on are not readily translated perfectly as the, you know, able to translate the, the meaning from some of the, you know, the Dhamma words. Uh, anyway, so it's from that, uh, having that purified mindfulness and equanimity that you're able to uh, observe the five aggregates arising and vanishing and and the last traces of the ego or I consciousness f fade away, and that's when you attain a, <clears throat> you can attain stream entry or any of the other levels of uh, the path. So basically, that's the, you know what the those four jhanas are, but and also is. It corresponds to uh, the seven factors of enlightenment. Because when you're practicing mindfulness in the fourth foundation of mindfulness, also develops concentration. Because you can develop concentration to the level of jhana while practicing mindfulness. This is the misunderstanding. The people make these big differences between concentration and mindfulness. <clears throat> uh, but in, in mindfulness meditation and vipassana, you attain what is called vipassana jhana. That means the mind isn't focused on one object, it's focused on the stream of impermanence. But the hindrances also get suppressed and, the, and that it's equal to that jhanic level of uh, clear mind in the fourth jhana. Because you can understand this if you if you read the seven factors of enlightenment. Seven factors of enlightenment are within the Dhamma Nupassana. That means the fourth foundation of mindfulness. <clears throat> and traditionally that's the way one attains uh, enlightenment. That's why they call the seven factors of enlightenment. <clears throat> and the first one is mindfulness. The second is investigation of Dhamma. That means using the applied and sustained thought to, well, what are these five aggregates? You know, well, you know, you're contemplating these, uh, uh, like the five hindrances, the five aggregates, the six senses. And then the seven factors of enlightenment comes after that. Uh, Actually, the seven factors of enlightenment, excuse me. Uh, so you get mindfulness, first one. Mindfulness means being alert to what is coming through the mind or, you know, starting to disturb the mind. Then you investigate it. You know, what is this? Why is it disturbing me? How does it arise? How does it cease? These are very clear instructions that the Buddha gave. Uh, so it involves an intellectual kind of intellectual investigation and contemplation. And while you're doing that, you, you get a lot of energy. So energy is the third factor of enlightenment. And that means that sleepiness has been abandoned. So you're already developing the, the jhana factors of, of, of applied and sustained thought because you're thinking just about the Dhamma and about 
you know, what's going on in you. It's not random thinking like the ordinary person gets, uh, you know, it's directed thinking. Uh, so you get a lot of, because you're starting to see things, you know, as you're being mindful and investigating, you're, you're seeing the uh, aggregates come and go and the six senses because you've already contemplated them. You get, you get like, like a scientist getting close to the end of their experiment. Like all these scientists, right? They're trying to develop a COVID vaccine. Who could get there first, right? So they probably stayed up the whole night and they, you know, because they, they were excited about, oh, I'm getting close now. We're getting close, right? Donald Trump's calling up. Are you there yet? Are you there yet? <laughs> I'm kind of exaggerating. Not, uh, really. not as bad as Donald Trump exaggerates, but <clears throat> okay. I'm sorry. Some papa lapa. Uh, so anyway, so this uh, that energy, you know, banishes drowsiness and sleepiness, and then. The happiness arises. Piti. Piti sambo janga is a factor of enlightenment. So that means you're, you're, you're in jhana already. You've got applied the sustained thought, you've banished sleepiness, and you got the piti. So already you've got these jhana factors while practicing four foundations of mindfulness. That's why I understand these people talking about thinking you can't attain jhana by practicing mindfulness. It's very clear in Buddha's instruction. So anyway, um, and then because of the, the, the piti, then you got the pasadi, the, the tranquility of body and mind. So all these are aspects of, of jhana. And then the sixth enlightenment factor, after all that, then concentration. Then you attain concentration. Because you have developed the jhana factors while practicing the mindfulness. It's very clear if you read all those instructions. Uh, and then after the concentration is the equanimity. And that's the hallmark of the third and the fourth jhana is equanimity. And that's why once you reach, you attain this jhanas through the practice of mindfulness, through the development of the seven factors of enlightenment. And then at any moment after that, one could, uh, you know, have the breakthrough to the stream, you know, or attain any one of those uh, four levels of uh, the path and fruits. So, anyway. Would you say more? about the difference between tranquility and equanimity. How are they different? Uh, tranquility just helps you to relax. Equanimity is the mind that, because of, equanimity is based on wisdom. Uh, in understanding the emptiness of all phenomena. So you, you stop bending towards pleasure or pain. So it's, it's one of the most purified states of mind because you only hear about equanimity when you're talking about the third and the fourth jhana or the sankara upekka, the last stage of the seven factors of en enlightenment. So, you know, equanimity is the result of all the previous practices. I don't, you can't practice equanimity. When people say they practice equanimity, they're practicing sensory restraint. They're exercising mindfulness and restraining themselves from wanting to scratch the itch or to move around. Uh, so they're, you know, they're practicing to be equanimous. But if you study how equanimity arises and where it's mentioned, it's only mentioned in those last stages before enlightenment itself. Uh, so anyway, you know, a person can attain those four jhanas by, you know, like say, 
practicing anapanasati and and so on. But even anapanasati doesn't mean just staying with the breath, breathing. If you read the Anapanasati Sutra, it also talks about beholding impermanence, breathing in, breathing out, uh, experiencing fade away, relinquishment, and so on. So it, it also uh, uses insight in that. But anyway, those are explained in different ways, but that's why some people get confused with the, the practice. But so you can attain, you know, the jhanas by, you know, singling out and focusing on, you know, a particular object until you, uh, you know, you reach the concentration. But then again, that object uh, then is no longer important. Then you develop the insight into the, you know, anicca dukkha Another question. Bhante, when you have mindfulness, I was thinking maybe investigation happens just like you're saying uh, equanimity happens. I thought maybe investigation of dharmas, it's when you start being able to see chittas, arising of chittas, this momentary my, moments of mind arising and passing away. That's you know, only part of it. It's only part of it. Right, but I thought that it's not just like you mentally start thinking about them. I thought no, it is. It is. You, you start thinking about it. I thought you, you become... because if you if you read the instructions, it said the meditator understands how this hindrances arise, how will it cease, and how does it stop coming back in the future. That because you are contemplating it, it arose because I've been practicing these habits. It ceases when I stop exercising the habits. And so it, it, it definitely is this discursive thinking in the beginning. But that's the stage where you start being able to see the moments of consciousness. No, it comes even before that. Even before that? Yes. Like you sit down, you know, in this body. You know, if you just sit down, okay, this is my body. No, you got to kind of, this body is just made up of four elements. You, you try to feel them. Oh, this is the earth vibration. This is the water vibration. So as you're experiencing them, you're, you're trying to understand them. And how does the feeling of body arise? Do you understand how the feeling of body arises? Because if you don't, you're going to be a cling to it and attached to it. So the feeling of body arises as I explained today. You're feeling different sensations. These are feeding into the brain and the brain is weaving them together to create a perception because of all the sensations from your feet, your arms and your head. That's what the brain does. You know, it, it puts these things together and then the perception of body comes in and then my body. That's created by the mind. So, the, the, so that you have to understand that because if you don't understand the process, it, you're, it's going to be much harder to uh, let go of it. So the sense of dissolution of body actually comes at the first stage, at the stage of mind. Uh, don't try to begin to don't make it too complicated. Huh? You're trying to, you know, make it more complicated. I'm just trying to understand. Is. I know I understood this practice of enlightenment. I mean, very common. Between a sequence, it just was always a puzzle to me. Um, so no, they, they definitely have a sequence to it. You, you can't investigate something if you're not holding it in front of your mind first. So that's why the mindfulness is able to single out and, and uh, you know, being able to focus on a pain. What is this pain? It's just molecules rubbing and bumping into each other, producing friction then the mind, because it doesn't like it, it calls it pain. But actually it's just a vibration. And, and it's impermanent. You, you observe it. You see how it's changing, how it can dissipate and even vanish after uh, some time. So it's like, you know, looking at it under a microscope. It's like, a how does a scientist find out anything? If a scientist looks through a microscope, he, he just says, oh, that's interesting. 
But it doesn't put two and two together to figure out what's actually happening. It's not going to do him much good. He can look through the microscope the rest of his life and then never develop the cure for cancer. He's got to have some understanding that he reads in books first. That's why they go to school, isn't it? Right? You learn these theoretical physics, you learn chemistry, you learn biology. That's the information that then when you look through the microscope, you got something, you, you got some kind of framework to start with. Other than the mind, it will just, it won't, it won't get focused. And so that, that's what the Dhamma is. The Dhamma, having a good Dhamma knowledge, helps us to focus and understand what we are experiencing. Otherwise, the mind will just get created with delusions and say, oh, that's God talking to me, or that's whatever, you know, that's how people get deluded, because they don't have the Dhamma to keep their mind focused and understand what is, what is happening. So that would be dissolving five aggregates, right? This, <clears throat> but at what point here um, you see chitas and chitasikas arising? Or, I mean, I don't know. Don't, don't worry about it too much. You'll know it when you see it. You know, if you try to figure it out now, you, you won't be able And I can't tell you. You can see a chitasika. If you have the desire to scratch, that's a chitta seeker. If you have a thought in your mind, that's a chitta. You don't have to have jhana to see that. Chitta is a mental state. Chitta, chitta seekers are different types of. Uh, I don't want to go into that now. Sorry. Okay, yeah. That was only the first question, my gosh. Sorry about that, folks. Sometimes you get carried away. <laughs> oh, I don't know if I answered that initial question or not. Did I? How do you attain jhanas? Of course, there's those are those first four jhanas are called the form jhanas, and there's something that's called the formless jhana, but it's not normally. They're usually they're called the arupa jhana, yeah. But uh, those are not needed to attain enlightenment. Okay, can you elaborate? what awakened awareness is again. Is it a state one maintains throughout the day, even while driving? Only an arhat. An arhat will have permanently awakened awareness, but not others, not even an anagami or a once a turner or a sotapana. But they will have moments of and periods of time when they can uh, maintain it. And it may not be the... the see, there's many de, uh, gradations of all these states too. So when you say, is one enlightened? Well, there's a difference. Even a sotapana is enlightened to a certain extent. And you know, once returning is enlightened to a little bit more than that. And you know, once returning is enlightened more than that. And then our hunt is fully enlightened. So you have to qualify when you're using some of these terms. You have to kind of qualify uh, the, me the meanings of it. In the same way as concentration has many levels to it. Insight has many levels to it. So awakened awareness is, is also many levels. Once you can start feeling the, the subtle vibrations, that's a beginning of awakened awareness. And once you can start feeling more and more things, coming, that is awakened awareness. It's not the full state, but that is working toward that. So, 
and again it's it's connected with the like the fourth jhana level of concentration that's that would be you know really awakened awareness but the reason why it's not fully awakened because hindrances are still coming in from time to time uh, so on okay but you know especially in the in the body when i talked about you know when you focus on the body vibrations when you start to feel some sensations then that will allow you to start feeling even more sensations and then more sensations and then more sensations uh, because like this is this, this a vibrating web that's in the nervous system and things are interconnected uh, so when you feel some subtle sensation in one spot it's like your attention is going deeper and deeper into the unconscious mind and so you're 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 feeling a subtler and subtler levels of awareness uh, and so when you reach one level of awareness you're closer to the one underneath it before you were two steps away now you, you reach like just to watch your breath is a level of awakened awareness because most people are not awake to that at all you've got to pay attention to it or to focus on trying to feel the blood pulsing in different places so when you put your attention on that you're going to then automatically feel something that's happening next to it or on the next subtle level uh, then when you get down to that level and you keep your attention there you'll feel something on the next subtler level then you get established in that level and then you feel start feeling a few things at the next subtle level then you get established in that level see that's how it works You know, by keeping it, that's why the longer you keep your attention, you know, like, you know, in these meditations, I say, okay, now we'll feel your feet. Okay, when you first put your attention there, you might not feel too much, but you got to hold it there longer. And the longer you hold the attention in the one area, you'll naturally start feeling more sensations. And that's why you need the concentration, because you can't hold your attention there because you're not concentrated. You get too distracted. So the concentration helps you to hold the attention on the spot longer so that you can start feeling the movements and sensations within that uh, spot. And the longer you can hold the attention without distraction, you feel subtler and subtler and subtler and subtler. Uh, levels and so the ability to move your attention to another spot like you know after feeling the feet move, move it to the hands or move it to any part of the body immediately you may, you may not feel something but the longer you hold it there with the concentration it's like a magnifying glass then you will start to feel it that's why the average person cannot feel nothing because their mind is not concentrated at all. It's hardly ever in the body. Only when they stub their toe or cut their finger or get a bellyache, oh, yeah, I have a body. Otherwise, they're just lost in their mind most of the time. So <clears throat> that's why you know, this mind is a very, you know, powerful and mysterious, you know, phenomenon. This this mind and. Uh, Trying to plumb the depths of it is, you know, it takes a, a lot of work. But it's the only game in town. And that you just want to suffer the rest of your life. Or not necessarily suffer, but uh, go around in circles. That's suffering. Yeah. Ask Donald Trump if he's suffering. He probably will say no. Okay, here we go. Yes. So you talked about the, the levels of subtle.
subtlety and going deeper into it. Is there an ultimate level of subtlety? The I am. I am. That's the last thing to really to, to, see, to see clearly. That's why the five aggregates, these, these are the level of suffering, the five aggregates. The material aggregates is the first one because it's easiest to see. But once you're focused on the material aggregate, that means in the body, you start to see the feelings that are arising in the body then you can see the feelings. So the feelings are subtle in the gross physical body. I mean, to see them clearly arising. And then the perceptions are based on the feeling. What you feel, you perceive. And the perceptions are the thought images that pop out. So normally we don't see those, we look around, but we don't see them popping out at us. So we just see things as a smooth flowing thing. But when you're sitting, especially with sound, sounds are the best thing because you know, with a sound, you identify it immediately, right? When you're quiet, all of a sudden I speak something, doesn't the image of Bhante Bahuda's voice come into your mind? or if a door slams, or the toilet flushes, right? Don't these pictures just pop into your mind, these words? Yes. That's a perception. We don't normally see them popping into our mind like that because they come much more in our ordinary state, you know? Yeah. And, and they're based on the sensations. They don't arise unless there's some stimulation the perceptions. And usually it's because the perception is of a painful and pleasant feeling. Those are the ones that grab our attention the quickest. And then based on the perception, it triggers off your thoughts, the past and future history connected with that perception. Let's say you're in a, a fog and then you, you see a form coming, but you can't really see who it is. So you don't really have much thoughts about it, or you might be worrying it as a little, a, you know, a robber or something. <laughs> but let's say, then all of a sudden the fog clears and you see that face and instantly you recognize it. Ah, that's, that's my friend, or that's an enemy. So that's a perception. And then you start worrying of fear about it. Or what are you going to do about it? That's the sankaras. And, uh, you know, you can see them very clearly arising. And then only when you're able to see those things, then at the end, you can clearly see that, that, that sense of I, I and me. Or you can actually see the consciousness like a flash bulb going off with each moment of uh, stimulation. Maybe not exactly like a flash bulb going off, but sometimes you, you can, but it's, a, it's very clear, it's, you know, it, it uh, flashes like that. So all those are, those are very, very subtle things. The average person is never gonna see that because their mind is too gross. That's why only in meditation, when you focus your attention, can you uh, begin to perceive those deeper levels. Because it's the unconscious mind. These things are occurring within the, the unconscious levels. See, our mind is a very mysterious thing. I mean, there's conscious mind, which most people are in. And then there's the unconscious mind, which is this, you could call the storehouse of all our previous experiences and everything else. Like when you dream, you're experiencing the unconscious mind, dream images. Uh, but then when you wake up from the dream, they, they disappear because now your attention is in the, in the immediate external world. So as long as the immediate external world is taking your attention, you have no way to, you won't be able to access all those stuff is always coming up. Anger comes up from the unconscious. 
let's say you're sitting here and you're quite peaceful, but then you know something happens to cause you anger. So that anger was sitting there, resting there in the unconscious mind, waiting for a chance to pop up, but it needs a stimulus. So there's some stimulus, and all of a sudden you, you feel this shaking and you know anger coming up. That's a, like an eruption from the unconscious in the mind. But when you're meditating, you can see uh, those things much more clearly before they've actually erupted on the surface. You can see them starting to form because now you're, you're observing them from a deeper level. And then you can kind of put some space around it and say, okay, I'm starting to get angry now. Okay, let's relax. You know, it's not, not a big deal. And you can kind of prep yourself. It's like early warning signals. So you can prepare yourself and help to uh, mitigate or minimize getting angry. But see, most people are not able to do that because the anger just erupts, boom, because they're not, uh, you know, they haven't caught it soon enough. Or they're not aware of the situations that produce anger. Like if you know there's a certain person when you talk to them, it always winds up, you wind up getting an argument or something, right? So when you have to be around that person, you're already on guard, you know, okay, this is a potential. Now let me not get, you know, if something happens, let me not get upset, you know, let me have met this, so you really prep yourself. So when it does happen, hopefully you won't get so uh, angry or upset uh, about it. Uh, did I answer your question, Judah? You did. Thank you, Bhante. So I am at the five aggregates. So when you, I'm not quite sure. No, the sense of I is not one of, one of the aggregates. Uh, the Buddha gave a simile, the thought of I am. The I am doesn't, you know, the fragrance of a flower, he said, it doesn't belong just to the petals or to the stem or the different parts of the rose, but when they're all together, then you got the fragrance. So the same way when the aggregates are together, the, the thought of I am uh, comes up. But as you start overcoming and seeing through the aggregates and not reacting to them so much, then that already starts weakening little by little the strength of the I am. When you see how the body is not myself, feelings are not myself, perceptions are not myself, just like these instructions I mentioned that the Buddha was telling in the, the, in the sutta, right? Those are the Buddha's instructions. It's amazing, right there in the sutta. It's, you know, this is how the Buddha trains his disciples. And it was just that. It wasn't in the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. Of course, he may have taught that later, but the essence, the kernel of it was, he trains them to see form is not myself, feelings are not myself, perceptions, formations, consciousness is not myself. Now it's the, it's the consciousness that normally we identify as being myself. No. Because only we call the body my body, but we know this body is going to die and decay. So it's probably easiest to see, okay, is, you know, and the same with feelings and perceptions, but the consciousness, that, that is what most people take to be their soul. When people talk about the soul, probably it means that they think that this consciousness is going to go to some state after death and live eternally, whether it's in a heaven at the feet of God or whatever they believe, or in hell. And they think it's going to be a permanent state. Sounds like the Kusati Yeah. The Buddha called him a foolish, foolish. <laughs> Empty-headed fool. Empty-headed fool. 
Okay. Anyway. Uh, hmm? If you have time, then there is some one question on chat. Yeah. Is there a question on the chat? Yeah, it's just a few words left. You people have been listening to all this all this time out there in virtual land. Okay, this question uh, that came up on a chat from our friend uh, Bhaskar. This is the Ma in the Maha Satchika Sutta, which is the one I talked about last week. Uh, Although I didn't, uh, I talked about the Chula Satchika Sutta last week. I'm going to talk about the Maha Satchika this coming Wednesday. So I haven't actually got there yet on my Wednesday, but he's talking about the Maha Satchika. Uh, so the occurred to the Buddha, why don't I keep practicing breathless absorption? So I cut off the breathing uh, through my mouth and nose. What is this meditation? It's complete. It's a yogic technique. You know, in yoga, there's some techniques where you suspend your breathing and you try to, uh, you know, it's kind of called Kavala Kumbhakam. Uh, but, uh, you know, in the Buddha practiced these kind of yoga techniques, but he, he found them really not to be that helpful. So he gave them up. Uh, so, But of course, when you attain the fourth jhana, or even like Naroda Samapati, your breath will also seem to cease, to become so slight that uh, it might not register on, uh, on you know, the scientific instruments. You know. uh, so, but the person's not dead. They can maintain that you know, state for some time. You should still get oxygen in through your pores of your skin because the skin breathes too. And so if there's a vacuum of no air inside, the body will pull air through the, the pores of the skin. Uh, at least that's what, according to my yoga teacher, <laughs> he was saying this. Um, <clears throat> So another question, how can I overcome guilt, seeing it mindfully? Well, if you've done something that you're feeling guilty of, first you acknowledge it, okay, I did, I did this, whatever it was, but I did it because, you know, I'm not, you know, I cannot yet control my, you know, my emotions or passions or, or whatever. So you might have done something, uh, breaking a precept or something else that you're ashamed of. It's because, you know, our mindfulness and our training is not up to that level where we can prevent ourselves from sometimes doing that. And so actually that fear of doing shame, the here, you know, tapa, these are, these are considered to be, uh, you know, positive spiritual state. So feeling shame at having done something wrong helps you to muster up the energy not to do it again. Why is it shame? Yeah. So and the fear of the fear of uh, dread, the fear of doing wrong because of the shame and guilt that will come. Uh, so it's good to have those because it helps you to try to resist the urge to keep doing these kind of things. So by mindfulness, but, but just remaining guilty is not, not a useful thing. You've got to you know, sort of not repent. We don't like to use the term re repent, but usually telling somebody else, that's why monks, whenever they, if they break a, a training rule, they're supposed to confess it to another monk. And the reason is, you know, it takes a lot of guts to do that, right? You don't want to be exposed, although you're going to know I did this. And if you don't tell anybody, you, you just keep it to yourself and you can go on breaking these things all the time and no one may even know about it. But if you actually have to tell 
somebody else that you've done that, then you will muster up the energy more because you don't want to be seen as a fool, uh, keep breaking the, the rules over and over and over again. So that's why it's a, a part of the, you know, the monk's uh, training. So anyway, uh, yeah, you, you see the, the urges to, you know, what, whatever you did, you see it mindfully, but then you have to make the determination. That's what's called adittana, the determination to be more mindful and try not, not to do it again and to avoid the situations where that might come up. You know, <clears throat> actually avoiding places is one of the ways of overcoming the, in the sabhas of the sutta, one of the, I think it's eight or ways of overcoming the asavas or the defilements. One is through uh, avoidance. Uh, not going to places where you know your passions will get stirred up. So you avoid those kind of places or you avoid seeing certain types of people. Make sure you're trying to stop smoking, you give in and you feel guilty, oh, I can't stop smoking. My friends are smoking, they don't hang out with them. So, you know, if you're trying to overcome something, don't hang out with people that are still doing that because if you're not strong enough, you, you know, you won't be able to resist the, you know, wanting to be part of the gang, right? That's what happens, to, you know, especially young people, you know, the peer pressure. So they kind of start doing unwholesome things, and, but then, they, were, then they, they get too far over their head. And then, you know. Anyway, I think uh, that's, that'll be enough for, for this discussion. Okay. So we're just sitting where just to, we're going to stand up in a second, but just take a deep, slow breath. Hold your breath in several seconds, kind of just try to let all that excitement of all that talk, uh, let go of that. Just feel the body. Just come back to the present moment here and now. And let out the breath, feel that relaxation of the body and mind. Just feel the buttocks pressing the floor. Okay, now slowly stand up to stretch your legs.